Welcome, uh, fellow Rotarians and guests, to meeting number 5,265. Uh, you'll see the birthday slide up there that uh, our staff will put up, uh, John During. Uh, we don't have anyone that ha actually was born on this day, September 2nd, so uh, we won't be announcing them. A couple of things. Remember to mute your microphones to avoid distracting the speakers, and uh, there will be no breakout rooms today, but I'll make uh, some further comments on that. What you heard was the marimba. That's a musical instrument uh, from the Isthmus of Tehuantepec in the state down as one of the southern states in Mexico where Chiapas, Oaxaca, and Tabasco come together. The Maya used that instrument and that was uh, brought over from African slaves and it's a Bantu word and that's what they call their musical instrument in Africa, uh, marimba. It consists of a set of rosewood bars graduating in length, which have musical tones when struck with a mallet. And there are variations found all over the Far East and Africa, Europe, and the Americas. Um, you may be familiar with the xylophone, which is just another version of the marimba, as is the vibraphone and the glockenspiel. But anyway, so much for that. Right now, we've got Sal Pizarro coming in. He's going to uh, tell us what's <clears throat> going on. He's the pride of UC Santa Barbara, world-renowned San Jose Mercury News columnist, and man about town who will tell us what's going on. What's going on? What's going on? Want to know what's going on? I'm not sure that I'm I'm world-renowned yet, but <laughs> I'm going to share my screen here, and we're going to let you know what's happening. Hold on, let's see. Hey. Are you co-host? I'm, I'm a co-host. I'm, I'm, I'm working on a technical issue at the moment. Let's see if we can get this going. My slideshow disappeared. So now I'm trying to call it up. Is well, I'm going to start anyway, and I hope that this thing gets... Uh, there we go. Okay, now I can share that. Uh, let's see. Don't worry, I won't, I won't take up extra time because of that. All right. We're, we're flexible. Okay. And we're going to present. There you go. Okay. Looking for restaurants. All right. There's a big internet load today. So anyway, well, I'm just going to start by telling you. So the Downtown Association uh, has launched a new campaign, uh, hashtag DTSJ Open, which has included some TV spots on NBC Bay Area. And on their website, they've also got a longer video that showcases downtown people and places, including our own Lisa Millette from City Lights Theater. Now, the two themes of the campaign are downtown is open and we miss you. Uh, you know, both those things are important to keep our businesses going. And you can go to www.sjdowntown.com. It's right down there. To get more information about the restaurants and other merchants, including uh, hair salons and barbershops, that are open right now. And there's also some virtual experiences that you can enjoy. So next up, uh, we've got the sixth annual San Jose Poetry Festival coming up over six days next week, starting on September 8th. This is all online this year, and will include a keynote by former US Poet Laureate Juan Felipe Herrera on September 11th. Now, there's a wonderfully diverse lineup of readings, slams, and workshops. It doesn't matter whether you are a poetry expert or a newbie, just it doesn't get verse than this, as Brian Adams might say. Uh, you can <laughs> buy a ticket to a single event, or you can get a pass for the whole week. Go to the Poetry Center website, pcsj.org, for the schedule and for ticket information. Now, one of the big uh, fall events that we usually have is the San Jose Museum of Art Gala. If you've ever seen it or been to it, they take up the circle of palms. It is usually artistic and gorgeous. And of course, this year we can't have it. Uh, it will be online, but it will be no less entertaining, featuring performances from several Bay Area arts groups, as well as special appearances by Broadway actor Ryan Vasquez, a Bellarmine alum, uh, who will perform an excerpt from Hamilton and Van Anvo, who will perform with the Blood Moon Orchestra and present a special song written just for this event. 
Now, the best part, if you're thinking, oh, you know, it's, it's kind of an expensive thing, general admission tickets are totally free to this event, although I know many of you may indeed be uh, donating during the event. But if you want to just enjoy the performances, it's totally free. And finally, we'll get a little uh, activity in. Bike to Work Day is normally in May, but the pandemic and the fact that everyone was working from home kind of got in the way of that. So this month we have Bike to Wherever Days. Uh, maybe you're not biking to work, maybe you're biking to the store, biking around your block, and the official day is September 24th, but you're being encouraged to ride your bike the whole month of September. And if you register on, uh, I believe it's lovetoride.net, you can uh, rack up your miles and eventually uh, earn some prizes. Uh, you can see those three websites I've got listed on the slide and get more information and writing tips, including maps right there. And that's what's going on for September, Fernando. Thanks, pal. Thank you. And don't forget to say that there's free parking. Now we got Mauricio Cordova right. in Mexico City, or Mexico DF as they call it, like uh, being from Washington, DC. He came to San Jose, uh, to San Diego, beg your pardon, San Diego, when he was 16 to play tennis. Then he attended uh, San Jose State for three years and finished off Cal State Hayward got a degree in accounting. He heads loaves and fishes family kitchen here in San Jose, but he commutes all the way from Roseville. He's got the inspirational thought for the day. Mauricio, hit it. There you go. Okay, now I unmuted myself. So thank you, Fernando. I appreciate it. Uh, the kind uh, uh, introduction. Hello, everybody. Happy Wednesday. Um, well, when, when I put together this thought, I was like, what am I going to talk about? Because there's so many different things going on. And unfortunately, uh, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we got going on in about 61 days. That four years ago made it very stressful for a lot of us. Uh, you know, we have heard many times now in the news that this is the most important election of our times, of our lives. You know, there's a lot of things on the on the balance and uh, without getting too political on it, you know, it's been a stressful time for everybody. You know, it's gonna be a time of anxiety, fear, uh, but you know, we feel like maybe we're losing hope if our candidate doesn't win, right? So I know uh, we live in a political tornado. Uh, November 3rd will create maybe four more years of this or maybe we'll change, but either way, there'll be some change and it's gonna be difficult uh, as a country, as a society for us to, to kind of do that. So, you know, there's a couple of things here, a couple of feelings that keeps us going. And that's kind of where I want to focus today on uh, this uh, inspirational thought. <clears throat> One of them is hope. And like the uh, Honorable John Lewis, uh, rest in peace, said, be hopeful, be optimistic, never lose that sense of hope. And I think hope is very important. It keeps us going. It uh, gives us the strength to continue moving forward, you know, and it's, it's something that, you know, we need to hold on to, you know. Four years ago, unfortunately, I lost a lot of friends and even some relatives that I really don't talk to anymore because we found out that our ideological beliefs were different. And, you know, they were brought up more than maybe we had in the past. And the things that at one point we have in common were not strong enough to keep us, uh, to accept that, the, you know, these new differences and, uh, and keep being friends or being in touch. So there was a lot of, uh, you know, Facebook uh, friendships that went away, people that I don't text me anymore. And it is what it is, right, uh, on that. I've been a Rotarian for two years, a little over two years now. And I definitely do not want to lose any Rotary family or anybody to lose Rotary family. Uh, this election is a tough time for all of us because we are passionate about what we feel, you know, and both sides of this uh, equation. And this tornado has two different sides to it, right? Uh, something that I think is very important is, is to keep our kindness for each other. And I uh, found a... Uh, 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 a phrase here on the website from Racktivist, uh, kindness is having the ability to speak with love, listen to pa with patience and act with compassion. And I think, you know, as we are going through the next election, the next four years without becoming more divided, uh, we will need to keep our hope. We need to be kind and patient with each other, remind ourselves that they are, even we are different, we're very unique. And that's what makes uh, human race so pretty, so, so great uh, on that. And we're all citizens of the same world. So I know I'm kind of over my three minutes, but that's the one thought that I want to keep uh, everybody, keep your hope and, and be kind to each other. And we'll get through these, uh, these interesting times. 
Thank you, Mauricio. Next, we've got uh, Larry Sokoloff. He was born and raised in Orange County, fled to UC Berkeley for law degree, now teaches the First Amendment law at San Jose State School of Journalism. He chairs the meeting summaries committee that you guys read on every Friday. So give us our update there, Larry. Unmute yourself. Larry Sokolov, come in, Larry. Can you hear me? John, did you uh, make him <laughs> co-chair? Hello. How's that? Is that Larry? Yes, it is. Far away, pal. We're getting. We're okay. Getting... Thank you. Thank you for. Um... For um, waiting for me um, and thank you President Fernando for that introduction um, we're a small committee we're looking to expand our membership if you're looking for a simple easy way to serve our club then the uh, meeting summaries committee is for you there are no meetings to attend all you have to do is attend when the club's Wednesday meetings and write about it we'll give you a template and we'll train you our weekly summaries are more popular than ever since our meetings went online um, this is a great committee for people who like to write and who have a great sense of humor. Um, plus, you're coming to our meetings anyway, so you can bring your laptop. Um, it's a great resume builder. And finally, our members have gone on to meaningful careers in law, journalism, and even as executive director of this club. So contact me or the Rotary office if you're interested in joining. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. We made it in time to get over to the Fund and Friendship Committee, which is chaired by, co-chaired by the dynamic brother and sister duo of Audrey Fox and Matt Breaker. So Matt, a deputy DA, will give us an update. Are you there, Matt? I am President Fernando. Thanks so much. Where are we? Hello, Rotarians. Well, Fund and Friendship has been at work. We're trying to put together some events to bring back some uh, Rotary Fellowship. Uh, as you may recall, we did some Zoom firesides a few months back, so we're going to do some new events in the future, and here are a few that I'd like to tell you about. On Sunday, September 13th, we are going to have a whiskey tasting Zoom. Uh, this was our most popular Zoom fireside a few months back, and uh, it sold out, so I suggest you sign up early. Doug Smith will be uh, coordinating this event, and he will put together multiple whiskeys in tasting sizes and coordinate a place for you to pick them up or even he may drop them off. And then that night you go through the tasting, you learn about them, visit with fellow Rotarians. I heard from the last time we did this that it was a, a lot of fun and a huge success. So mark your calendar for that. And two days after that, bingo, Zoom bingo will be played. We will have a Rotarian as the host. So it'll be fun and exciting. And um, we've heard from other Rotarians that they've participated in Zoom bingo and it's been fun. So we're going to have that. And yes, of course, there will be prizes. And then on Thursday, September 17th, Strike a Pose. We will have some Zoom uh, yoga. And our host is going to be Anuja Chaudhry from the Almaden Valley Yoga Center. Um, and we hope you'll be able to come participate in that and uh, get calm and enjoy that as well. And then in order to get some more events going, we're going to be sending out a survey to the whole club to just get a feeling on whether or not people are completely Zoomed out, uh, if they have any ideas for other Zoom events that they've been to or they think would be fun, and to get a feeling of whether or not people are ready to participate in any kind of limited uh, social distancing friendly outdoor events, of course, consistent with our county policies on numbers and things. But please uh, take a look, uh, be on the lookout for that and, and uh, fill that out so we can get some more events going. But looking forward to seeing everyone uh, at those events. Just a Thanks, question President. there, uh, Matt, how are you gonna do a, <laughs> the whiskey tasting? Well, the whiskey tasting last time, uh, Doug puts together the little the individual tastings of multiple whiskeys and then sets a place where you can go pick up the box with those or he may be able to deliver them. And then that night he hosts it and uh, goes through the whiskeys and gives a little education about each one, uh, about what you're tasting, maybe the things that go, that go along well with that whiskey. And um, uh, it was a raging success at the uh, Zoom fireside, so I expect, uh, expect it to be that way again. I think so, that's the 13th, that's a Sunday, right? Yeah, it's a great way to start the week, I think. 
sounds like a great way. All right, thank you. We very promise much. your blood alcohol level won't get over a one out, so you'll be. Safe. You don't have to. You don't have to drive anywhere, right? Exactly. So we don't have to worry about you hounding us. All right. Well, I thank you for that report. That sounds exciting, and uh, please say hello to your uh, sweet sister Audrey. She uh, missed out on camera time, but we'll get her next time. Absolutely. All right. Next up, we've got uh, Arthur Weisbrot. He's a retired U.S. bankruptcy court judge. He's now chair of the Rotary Book Club, which is just finished reading this book called Color of Law by Richard Rothstein. And he wants to tell us all about it. Judge, are you with us? I am. I am. Uh, first, I very strongly recommend that you read that book, The Color of Law, and I suggest you read it as soon as possible. It is, in my opinion, one of the most important and interesting books that I have read in the last 10 years. The book explains and carefully documents how and why our country became so racially segregated. The main answer is that our federal and state and local governments mandated that segregation. Our Rotary Book Club is now reading that book at the recommendation of our member, Georgie Tilson. The book's author, Richard Rothstein, will be our Rotary speaker next Wednesday, September 9. So please read the book. Look forward to seeing you next week when Richard Rothstein speaks to us on Zoom and come with your hardest questions because I can guarantee he can handle them. Thank you, President. Well, thank you, Judge. I, I pointed this out at uh, another Zoom meeting I was in that uh, these uh, exclusionary clauses in land titles, for example, are nothing new. Uh, and I pointed out that East San Jose is largely Latino, not because they chose to live there, but because that was the only place they could buy property to own a home because they weren't allowed to buy homes in Willow Glen and other um, upscale areas uh, of uh, town in, here in San Jose. And, and this is true across the country. So it is a fabulous and interesting book, which explains so much as to why we are where we are today with respect to racial um, relations. Thank you for that report. Uh, I, would, I would recommend that as you're listening to him and reading the book, you think about some of the solutions that he's offering, uh, because that would be a very interesting topic of discussion. Absolutely. Right now, we've got a little bit of uh, time for me to give you uh, some announcements, like that grab and go fall barbecue, which is being sponsored by Bert George and the executive chefs for Wednesday, the 16th of September, from 4 to 6 p.m. at the History Park, San Jose. Remember, you have to register. You have to tell us what your entree preferences are and tell those those as soon as possible so we can order the kind of food we need to have. There'll be uh, beef, chicken, and vegetarian dishes. And we have available Rotarians who can deliver these meals to those of our members who are unable to drive for whatever reason. And if you're a driver and you'd like to help, let us know that and uh, we'll put you down as um, one of the volunteers to go reach out to our fellow Rotarians who are unable to join us. Uh, Jennifer Jones, I think you all received that. She's the new Rotary International President for 2022 and 23. She's from Canada. She understands how important it is to follow through with the Rotary's diversity, equity, and inclusion. Surprise, surprise. That's the coincidentally the same as our club statement on page seven of our club directory. I didn't know about this, but uh, we are on the same page. She says, I believe diversity, equity, and inclusion begins at the top and for us to realize growth in female membership and members under the age of 40. These demographics need to see their reflection in our leadership. Further, she said, I will champion double digit growth in both categories while never losing sight of her entire Rotary family. She has a law degree and has been in Rotary since 1997. Uh, of course, we all are aware of the passing of Chadwick Boseman, uh, the star of Black Panther, which who died this last weekend at age 43 uh, from colon cancer. Other films about iconic Black Americans that he portrayed was Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall, our singer James Brown, our baseball great Jackie Robinson, and of course, we're all still mourning the deaths of Jacob Blake, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and sadly, so many more. Uh, Rotary International Conference, Taiwan. Uh, it's coming up June, to, let's see. Well, the deadline to get those rooms is October 15th. 
the, the district set aside a bunch of rooms, 80 rooms, at $200 a night, which is a pretty good rate. Um, if you're interested in getting and going to uh, Taiwan for the conference on June 12th through the 16th, you really need to register before October 15th because after that date, they're going to give back the unused rooms and then you're going to have to pay quite a bit more if you decide to go. Uh, finally, in my announcements, um, if you have to miss this week or any other week's meeting, you can catch the action by going online. We've got a, um, a youtube.com uh, slash user slash sjrotary slash videos. Uh, but you can check with uh, our Rotary staff if you need to have that email address or that website, that web link. All right, those are the announcements that I have for the moment. Uh, don't forget, questions for the speaker only in the chat box when, the, when our speaker begins. We've got uh, Norman Klein, or Norm as he likes to be called, uh, who's going to be introducing him. Norm was born and raised here in San Jose. He went to my alma mater, San Jose High School. Then he, in 1975, he went to, or at least he graduated from Santa Clara University with a degree in history. He's the founder and CEO of Library World, which digitally automates over 3,000 libraries from K through 12 to the Library of Congress, believe it or not. Library of Congress, man. That's great. Norm. Will you introduce our speaker, please? I'd be happy to. Thank you, President Fernando. I have the privilege to introduce our speaker today, someone this club has been seeking for many years to present, Lenny Bandaka. <laughs> Lenny, his accomplishments really are uh, too long to list uh, in business, community, and public policy, but I'll try to hit some highlights. Lenny was the chief economic and business advisor to Governor Gavin Newsom and chair of the California High Speed Rail Authority. He is a senior partner emeritus of McKinsey and & Company and lecturer on inequality at Stanford Business School. He founded McKinsey State and Local Public Sector Consulting Practice and served over a decade on McKinsey's Board of Directors, retiring uh, from McKinsey in 2014. He has received his MBA from Stanford and holds an AB magna cum laude in economics from Harvard. He lives in Half Moon Bay with his wife, Christine, they raised their two daughters, and I believe he's just become a grandfather again. Yep. They are founders and owners of the Half Moon Bay Brewing Company, the Inn at Mavericks, and the Pacific Stan Standard Tap Room. He is also the primary owner of the Half Moon Bay Review, the community newspaper. Although Lenny can talk with great expertise and knowledge about a wide variety of subjects, he, is recently wrote, he recently wrote an article describing why he withdrew from his most, most of his statewide activities, shocking many, but highlighting a subject that business and government tend to ignore. It is my pleasure to welcome Lenny Medaka. Thank you, Norm. I appreciate the warm welcome and introduction. It's good to be with all of you here today um, and have a dialogue around the topic that Norm mentioned that I highlighted in a piece that I wrote in Cal Matters a couple of months ago on the challenge of dealing in today's world with anxiety and depression. Uh, let me briefly describe what my experience was and kind of the challenges I see it and then open it up for Q&A. Uh, let me start with my perspective on this topic does not come from a wide experience in either the business leadership um, history or in policy. It's really a much more of a personal one. Mm -hmm. While I have had uh, a little bit of exposure to the topic in when I was in government and had uh, to think about it a bit in my leadership responsibility in various managerial roles in my career, most of my perspective on the topic comes from a relatively recent set of experiences that um, were pretty pronounced for me that feels like uh, is something that we should be having a conversation about. So as Norm said, until March of this year, um, late March, I was Governor Newsom's chief economic and business advisor. And in that capacity was dealing with all the challenges as we were entering into 
the COVID environment, not necessarily uh, the very near-term public health issues, although acutely aware of them, but trying to understand what it meant for the economy, for jobs, for how we responded to it, um, was a, and continues to be a very challenging environment. And I was very much, wow, uh, very challenged by the situation, enjoying my time in government. And then I was hit with a very acute uh, episode of anxiety and depression that caused me to uh, put first take a little bit of time away and then ultimately resign my position. Um, as I said in the editorial that I wrote, um, while it was announced on, on a Friday at the end of the day that I had left to, to spend more time with my family and local uh, issues at home, which was true, it was kind of a sudden thing. And um, I had spent a fair amount of time very actively engaged across the state and just kind of went off the radar for uh, six weeks as I was recovering from this. And as I was coming uh, through the treatment and feeling a lot better, I was starting to tell people, first family and close friends about the story. And my actually my daughters uh, encouraged me to write it down, to be able to send to people to talk about it um, so they didn't have to spend the whole time explaining what happened. As I sent that out a little bit wider, I had a strong encouragement to publish it. Um, I had a few people tell me, very good, well-intentioned friends, not to do it um, under the view that it was way too uh, personal an issue. And if you decided to go public with it, it would end your in my career. And that's all that anyone would ever want to talk about again. And so well, just keep it private and no one needs to know which only reinforced my view that I should be talking about it because that's part of the challenge. Um, as I said in my piece, several years ago, I was in a mountain biking accident and broke my leg pretty badly. And uh, fortunately was with a number of other people who took me to the hospital and put plates in my leg and had six months of recovery and, and then was back. But it was never something that you're in a discussion or somebody sees you and you've got a cast on your leg and you don't describe what happened and people just say, oh, well, that's that sounds like uh, that wasn't any fun, but hopefully you'll get better and be back on a bike and healthy again. And that's what happened. It was six months of, of physical therapy and then I was back on a bike and uh, certainly talk about it. But when you have a mental health episode, people tend not to talk about it. It's too much of a... Uh, a, too much stigma around it. It's something that, you know, you don't talk about in polite company. And that's in part why I decided to write this, to say that this is something that um, we should be talking about. It's much more prevalent than people talk about. Various grades of challenge. Uh, Michelle Obama wrote recently that she, because of the, you know, uh, the, the world that we're operating in today is, is suffering from low-grade depression. And it's much more commonly spoken about in some circles, particularly in the entertainment industry, but it's not particularly open and discussed in business circles or in um, general senior leadership roles. And so I, I decided to write this. Um, I was fortunate to have both family and friends that were attentive and got me uh, the kind of intervention that I needed in treatment. I have was also very fortunate to have and have um, high quality health coverage and access even in the environment that we're in to high quality care. And I'm happy to say um, after a few months, I'm feeling great. And um, very much looking for my time, getting more sleep than I did before, exercising every day, spending time as Norm said with my new granddaughter and uh, starting this conversation. The last thing I'd say is I've probably written 75 or 100 editorials in my uh, career um, on a wide range of topics. This one uh, got more response by an order of magnitude than anything else I've ever written. A large number of people reached out to me, many of whom I didn't know, uh, describing often their own or a family member or a close friend's personal experience um, with mental health issues and 
unfortunately, many cases did not have uh, either the uh, attention or support from friends and family members or the kind of treatment that would have that it helped them and uh, many sad stories in response, but a lot of uh, interest in saying, how can we in normal times, let alone the environment where when we're, we're having these conversations over Zoom and people are self-isolating or, or not getting out and having social interactions uh, in person or having a chance to be as physically active as they might. And under an enormous amount of stress, how do we help have this be a conversation and have the kind of support and health coverage and treatment that we need to make sure that it does not end up in very uh, uh, unhealthy and uh, obviously unfortunate circumstances for people who don't get the kind of treatment. So um, again, as I said in the beginning, I do not consider myself an expert on this topic. Like many others who've had uh, issues like this, my experience is my experience. It may not be indicative of anyone else's circumstances. Um, so I don't want to pretend to have universal perspectives on what we should be doing more broadly. Um, I'm happy to talk about what, what, uh, what I saw and, um, and uh, talk about whatever else is relevant. But um, when Norm reached out and said, would you be willing to talk about this? Um, I said, I'd be happy to. And uh, in an effort to ensure that we're uh, encouraging people to uh, destigmatize the conversation, have uh, real adult conversations about the nature of the challenge and ensure that we are, as people have the kinds of health episodes that are associated with the complex organ called your brain, that we have the kind of coverage and treatment that we do for other types of health issues. And that in the future, uh, no one will have to say that, like I did, that um, you know, breaking my ankle was something that I could talk about and got real treatment and didn't, wasn't a big deal. And uh, it feels unusual to be talking about health issues associated with your brain. So with that, let me stop and turn it back to you, Norm, for uh, questions. Comments. Lenny, that, that is fantastic. I appreciate that and you know, coming out and being open. I know when you went off radar, we were kind of shocked in the community and common cause and other places. And, uh, when we read the article, I just was just amazed how brave you were to do that. I, I don't know if I, or anyone I know, could have done what you did. And I just really want to thank you for, for doing that. We do have quite a few questions. Uh, they tend to be tactical. Uh, you have such a wide range of experiences. That, so don't, don't, don't be surprised. You might get some high-speed rail questions, too, <laughs> just to lighten it up a little bit. Uh, but here's a couple here. Uh, a mental health tsunami is coming from SIP. What advice do you give employers for addressing the stress and anxiety their teams may be experiencing? And how do we create a culture that nurtures them, especially with your experience in business? It's a great question. And again, I think this is not a new issue, but the shelter in place and the challenge of operating remotely and what feels like you're either working from home or at home with your work, that there's little distance for many people and that has um, created a level of stress and, and exhaustion for many people. And, and I don't know what you all feel, but when I'm on Zoom for more than an hour or two, I feel like I need a substantial break. It's just exhausting. And so one of the most substantial set of responses I got to my piece was from business leaders, including several CEOs of substantial entities who ended up sending it around to their companies and saying, uh, first of all, uh, this is important that we're having this dialogue. Um, we have most large companies have EAP or other types of formal programs to deal with substantial challenges, but they're not necessarily something that are very responsive to early intervention or the challenge of just having the conversation. Um, what a lot of their encouragement of sending it out was to ensure that as part of an overall corporate policy but or organizational policy, but honestly, more importantly, in the teams and smaller groups with which we operate, that you make some space for the conversation. It's something that's hard to do without the senior person being prepared to say that this is something that we want to be talking about, that it's uh, if you legitimize the conversation and have it be part of a organizational health conversation, as opposed to 
an, an individual circumstance that becomes something that is important to uh, have a have a, a real dialogue around. My friend Bob Sutton, who's a organizational uh, psychologist and professor at Stanford, wrote a Wall Street Journal piece on uh, the importance of uh, very recently of in the Zoom environment that we're in that we really have to set boundaries and have an uh, open conversation in our teams and our, with our colleagues around how we work and when we're off and when we're on uh, so that we're not exhausting everyone. This isn't a very short-term sprint. We're going to be operating in a different environment for quite a while and without having a basis to have that dialogue within your teams and our organizations, I think we're going to risk having even more burnout and more challenges of uh, people's own uh, well-being. And it's something that um, a number of people have suggested to me that they are starting new dialogues in their companies and their organizations about how to, um, how to have that discussion and address it. Well, Lenny, there's a lot of questions, so I'm going to kind of combine a few of these. One is looking back, did you ignore any signs of depression? And looking back, could you actually tell? In addition, uh, can you describe any non-chemical treatments that you found helpful? Uh, and what treatments generally, if you can share with us, seem the, the, the best for you without going too personal? So um, on the first part of that question, looking back, now looking back, I could I, ha I recognize the patterns, but like many who have experienced these kinds of episodes for the first time, you don't recognize them when you're going through them. Um, it's part of why I think having other people around you who can recognize the more subtle changes are an important part about it. Um, for me, it was things like um, not getting enough sleep, having, um, I was really uh, operating under um, an environment where I was always on. I was um, not eating as well regularly or as healthily as I should. I was not getting out and, and exercising regularly. Um, and towards the more pronounced end of it, I'd have challenges getting up and getting energy in the morning and feeling like everything was, you know, we, when your brain's in that kind of mode, uh, you know, from my analytic lens, it feels like every decision tree of where things could go ended up with a bad outcome. And that's obviously not the case. And so, but when you're in that frame, um, that's the way it feels. And so for me, it was just exhaustion as much as anything. Uh, as And now looking back, I can see it, uh, it happening and, and occurring over time. It just was got to a point that we needed, I needed a much more substantial change in behavior to and intervention to be able to deal with it. Um, I feel like I would be offering uh, inappropriate medical malpractice if I were to offer advice on what uh, what interventions would work. I can tell you what worked for me um, was pressing the restart button, um, was very definitely a just check out for a couple of weeks. For me, it was partly impatient didn't necessarily need to be. Group therapy did not work for me. Um, Zoom uh, it can work for others on these types of issues. For me, it did not. Um, what really helped was just a, what was really a, a restart and recharging of sleep and exercise and a little bit of help from some medication to enable me to sleep better. But um, most of it was really getting out and um, I've been... Um, sleeping more than I did since I was a kid and getting uh, regular exercises really helped enormously. Um, having professionals who can monitor you and check for things that are not, that need more medical intervention was important too. I did go through a full spectrum of tests and, and uh, wasn't something more substantial, but I don't wanna suggest that the answer is sleep and exercise, although that certainly helps um, if there's something more substantial going on. From a more public policy point of view and less personal, there's quite a few questions about the general population. Uh, Gregory from Catholic Charities indicated that, I don't know what percentage here is indicated, but a large percentage of clients coming for help for food also sh is showing signs of uh, mental depression and anxiety. Uh, how might we uh, tackle this from a community point of view, from a community health point of view? And combine that with the, obviously, um, 
different pl playing fields as far as uh, uh, people with income and people without uh, in income, people with insurance, people without insurance. I, I think it's a really, really important uh, question. And I noted in my piece that I am not naive that I had support from a position of privilege in my own circumstance, both personally in terms of people around me, but also in terms of health coverage and uh, my own personal um, situation that enabled me to take the time and get access to the kind of health coverage that I needed. And what was very clear to me and those I interacted with as well as a little bit more uh, exploration, the issue that I've been doing since then is that really was uh, a function of privilege rather than an expectation of normal circumstances. And I do think the challenges and stress and anxiety and uh, economic pain that we're in right now, let alone the public health issues are making this even more pronounced. It is, I suspect as the gentleman asked the question or mentioned that it is often uh, coexists with other issues, particularly uh, stress issues. And so trying from a policy standpoint to ensure that we have a broad definition and coverage of the health issues that are associated with mental health as we do with other physical health issues and the kind of capability and support that we need to treat that, um, I think is essential. I also think is like many things is not something that's a, you know, you go in, see a doctor for 15 minutes and get a pill and walk away and it's taken care of. This is ongoing support that's not particularly well suited to the nature of how in general our system is set up. And it's also one where, as I said, you know, if you've had an episode or an experience, that's your experience and it may not be indicative of what the broader uh, situation is. So to me, this is something that is much, much more widespread than we talk about. It's even more widespread in today's environment. And having the organizational response and the policy response that recognizes that has the funding to support it and the kind of mental health professionals that we need to deal with that I think is really, really important. Um, the last thing I'd say is obviously there are circumstances where this is going to require a deep physician expertise to be able to deal with particular circumstances. It's also something where I think um, like in other therapeutic interventions, different kinds of support that don't necessarily need to be, um, that can be different types of professionals can help as well. So some of the most helpful uh, interactions I've had are not with, uh, you know, MDs. They're with people who are, as I was when I was trying to get my leg working again with a person who knew how to get that muscle work. And again, this, this is the same in this circumstance. So again, as I said, I'm not an expert in all of this. I just do I recognize from my own experience and 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 uh, learning a little bit, and certainly the response that I got that um, while I can tell a good story about what the intervention was and how I've come through it, at least to date, um, that feels more unusual than it should be. <coughs> well, uh, there are way too many questions here to to even summarize. A, a lot of great ones. One is uh, you start this conversation saying that a lot of people warned you not to come out. That I said, this is going to end your career. Uh, it's too personal. It's too sensitive. Uh, people don't want to talk about it. Uh, how do you feel about that now? Do you think this is the correct decision? Or do you think this will, uh, quote, end your career, which I can't imagine. But uh, how, do you, how do you feel going forward now? Um, so I knew because of the people who suggested that to me were well-intentioned and really thoughtful and experienced that there was, um, you know, it was going to be something that is not without risk to come out and talk about it. Um, but as I said, that just reinforced for me the need to do it. Um, it. Frankly, writing it and being able to share it was cathartic in of itself. And so as part of a process, it was good for me. Um, and being able to have conversations like this where I don't feel uncomfortable in this conversation. It feels like we're having a good, honest dialogue around an important issue. That to me is feeling like I'm taking something that to me was just a horrible episode that I would not wish on anyone. I'm mean, trying to make something good out of it. So I'm really glad I did it. Um, I'm not worried about my own uh, 
future. I do think um, I, I feel like I'm um, underqualified to answer a lot of the questions around what do we really do about this. Um, on the other hand, uh, even to be able to have that conversation in, I mean, I, and I have had and have scheduled several dialogues with, you know, senior leaders and large groups of larger organizations that if they're having the conversation, that's a good start. And um, I do think there are important set of policy questions as well. Again, I'm not intending to be an expert on this topic going forward, but I really do think it's, it's a conversation that needs to be had. And I suspect you'll see more and more uh, people being prepared at senior levels to acknowledge their own circumstances. If the response I got was any indication there is so much wider spread um, uh, evidence that this is pervasive than anyone's talking about that uh, bringing it out in the open is a good idea. So I don't have any regrets. Well, uh, there is just a whole long list of thank yous uh, coming through the uh, chat, uh, that number one. And number two, I would like to personally invite you for the club to come back again and talk about the wide range of questions we have about all your other things you are doing, which is just an amazing career from brewing beer uh, to doing a local newspaper uh, to trying to get a high school rail done uh, to juggling so much you juggle through public policies such as common cause. So I just really want to thank you again for, for sharing your personal story and for uh, really being so brave. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, are we doing okay, President Fernando on time? Uh, you got, un, 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 we got 10 minutes. Great. Let me ask a few more questions here. Uh, they're coming through. Uh, yeah. Can you, can you go into a little bit more detail on what you think um, from a community point of view, uh, we can do to even the playing field? I know you mentioned this a little bit, but there are a lot of questions on this about public policy, how we can make sure that people have access to the services that, we privileged can can gain access to. So um, again, as I said, I'm not an expert on this topic. Um, I do think at the first instance, it's really two things. Um, number one is our health plans need to ensure that the kind of treatment that's required to effectively address this issue are part of our plans. Um, if you're being treated as someone was describing for a particularly different medical issue, but there's no capacity to treat you for the mental health issues, you're not treating the whole patient and getting them better. And so ensuring that we have a broad-based assumption that uh, this is part of what your core coverage should be and that everyone has that coverage, including in um, our Medi-Cal and Medicare plans, I think, is an important part of the question. Um, the second is this is a, um, a, a person intensive intervention. I don't think the answer to this is about a whole set of new pharmaceutical interventions. There may be some of that, but a lot of this has to do with, you know, the same kind of intensity that comes with physical therapy for. Uh, uh, who hurt themselves, hurt themselves. I think this is something that we have to ensure that we have the kind of high quality and compensated professionals who can treat this with a discipline and thoroughness that we can and being able to connect those people. I mean, I, I will say one of the things that I feel really fortunate happened to me is that um, in a way that without help from others, I would have had no idea about how to navigate. I actually got great support to get pointed to the right kind of professional support that I needed of different types. And that, if I were trying to navigate that by myself in the circumstances and the way I was feeling at that time, it would have been so daunting. I can't even begin to describe how I would not have been able to do that. And so- When you said that, that the Zoom uh, didn't quite work for you in the meetings. Um, quite a few questions on just the personal side of this as far as uh, what did work in general uh, and how your family uh, support structure helped uh, in, in sharing so, 
<clears throat> I mean, group therapy works for a lot of people um, and can be very helpful. And um, Zoom makes that harder because you don't have the, you, know, you can see, see some of it, but it's still not the same thing as being in the same physical space. And so uh, as I was leaving some inpatient time, I it was important to have a method to continue the the treatment afterwards. And so I tried the Zoom-based group therapy and it just did not work. It actually made it worse for me. That could be my personal experience and I don't want to generalize from that. But what did work is uh, first time. And so being able to just um, unplug and focus on getting better was really important. I did, uh, as I said, have some some uh, prescriptions, but I don't think that was as much of it as it was just getting a lot of rest and recovery time and then getting out and, um, and exercising and getting things moving again and, and uh, physically was an important part of it as well. Um, again, that's just me. I don't want to generalize from that, but um, I think there is, uh, from what I have read, uh, and again, running the risk of medical malpractice, I think there is little downside to the view that adequate sleep and uh, physical activity are good for you. And so uh, if you're under, uh, under indexed on both of those, that's a problem. And I was. And then the question around my family, um, I think you'd have to talk to them, but one of the things that was very clear is that this is, as they're more stressful on them as it is on, on the person who's going through it. And I really feel for that now. I can, um, I can see some of the things that I was going through or saying were really, really challenging. And you have to have people with strength around you who are knowing that you're saying things that are in because of the circumstance you're in. Um, not because of that's uh, how you feel or who you are. Uh, to me, it was more around a view of the world than self-harm or others, but something of that nature. But I certainly feel that um, being able to, and professionals, medical professionals that I <clears throat> had helping treated this, I think, appropriately as a partly a uh, an issue for a family and not just me was helpful as well. Um, in stress-filled environments as a family, if you throw this into it, it's like a lot of other uh, medical challenges. It just makes that even more pronounced for everybody around you. You know, people have been asking here to, to, to ask personal questions, and this just shows you how difficult this conversation can be because I have problems asking personal questions to them. Um, so I tend to kind of ask general questions and uh, my anxiety level goes up and I, you know, I'm just the person asking the questions. So that's, that shows you how difficult this, this subject can be. Uh, some asked, uh, did, did psychotherapy help at all? Well, other questions was looking back at your, your youth, did you, do you recognize any early signs of high anxiety as a kid or anything like that? Uh, those are the types of questions that, that I tend to have a problem asking, to tell you the truth, because it's yeah. it personal to me. So um, again, I, I, I hate to keep caveating everything that I don't want to generalize from my own experience, but I'm happy, you know, when you talk about this, you have to be prepared to talk about it. So this was a first time own experience for me. So I had nothing, no indication of anything before, no challenges early on in my life. I was have always been someone who thrived under conditions of you know, the more challenging and more stressful the problem and the situation, the more I liked it. Um, I was always one who operated on very little sleep and I still don't use alarm clocks no matter where I am in the world. I just say I need to get up at a time and get up at that time. So this was all new to me, which made it even more pronounced of not knowing um, what it was. Um, and I don't know what, uh, it's hard to, to know what, um, generalized from that. I do think one of the things I also did was to pull way back on, on uh, caffeine and um, alcohol, which were, um, you know, help our stimulants or depressants to deal with getting up or down during the day. And so, you know, when you're um, that on that roller coaster, that was probably not a good thing either. So that was uh, part of it, but I, right now I'm not, 
thing. I'm just getting it, seeing the world differently. Again, thank you, Lenny, and I look forward to having a a, a, a pint of beer over over, over yeah, the hill. I look that too. So thank well, you again for coming. Thank you. Uh, you've done a heck of a job, Norman, fielding a lot of these very um, personal questions. Of course, uh, we want to thank you, Lenny. Uh, I I pronounce it Mendoza, but there Mendoza, are people right. that say Mendonca because we don't have the Sedia in English alphabet. Right. But, uh, Mendoza. Grew up in East San Jose where the Five Wounds Church is, and that's primarily the Portuguese National Church. Okay, well, thank you for this program on mental health. That's a critical issue we have nationally. We've yet to address it satisfactorily on a national or local level, but thank you for the courage that you exhibited in coming out and telling us more about this very important part of our uh, health issue. And you're right, pointing out that we need to have that covered in our medical insurance, because if we don't, we are not likely to get the kind of treatment that you say needs to happen in order to get us through these very rough patches. Uh, by the way, uh, you should know that we have a contribution uh, that we made as a club on, on your behalf and on behalf of all of our program speakers to a nonprofit organization called Our City Forest, and they will be planting 46 shade trees out in East San Jose to combat what are called heat islands, uh, combat climate change and improve our neighborhoods. Um, and uh, I just want to add, if you have time, you're welcome to stay after this formal meeting ends at 1.15 to answer any other questions our listeners may have, our Rotarians. We'll have about 20 minutes after the our staff has to end <laughs> our Zoom meeting after uh, that period of time so I can get back to work. So, as you heard from uh, Judge uh, Weisbrot, next week's speaker is Richard Rothstein, who will be speaking on the color of law, a forgotten history of our how our government segregated America. That's the title of the book. And it's an interesting and fascinating book to realize that our country uh, throughout our history has uh, in our most vaunted institutions under the color of law have taken steps which have uh, fed the segregation of our community. And I think that's an important uh, topic. As he, Judge Weisbrot said, we ought to read it if we want to understand really what's at the root of a lot of the problems that we continue to have with respect to race and segregation. Uh, so that's something that we uh, can look forward to, and I invite you all to tune in to hear uh, Richard Rothstein uh, talk to us about that next week. So for now, uh, thank you so much, Lenny, for joining us. Um, I think giving up alcohol if you're an owner of two or three breweries is going to be a tough call. Well, I didn't say give up. I said cut back. <laughs> so. All right. So that means your health is back, Phil. Right, exactly. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. And, uh, Appreciate it. You bet. Now, to paraphrase my favorite immigrant governor, <laughs> as I like to say, hasta la vista, Rotarians, this uh, Zoom meeting stands adjourned. <laughs>